Greetings, beautiful, white, positive brothers and sisters serving white well-being, Blue Ninja Apostle. At your service, of course. Uh, Sunday, September 6th. Beautiful day of going free streaming by the one and only Jason Kuna. Kuna, Mr. No White Guilt. Great stream. Having a little music break right now, so I thought I'd uh, pop on here and just make a quick video midstream as he's going. So, been a few days since my last video. Been really tired, trucking. But had some ideas. And I'm gonna finally get a couple of those out here. Um, I am back in Las Vegas. Getting ready to make a delivery tomorrow on Labor Day. So I will be laboring on Labor Day. Uh, but I labor every day on a truck, so ain't no thing. Um, anyway, I hope you're all doing well. Appreciate each and every one of you. And uh, we're accomplishing great things in the white positive sphere for going free. And of course, for white well-being to save Western kind, to save our people. So here are my ideas, my thoughts lately. Um, first off, first off, um, some really amazing things been going on. Um, heard all about Yiz the Eunuch and someone else and she passed out flyers at a university in Tennessee. And, uh, uh I think it might have been John, if I got that right. Um, unbelievable. Getting a professor to use the word anti-white and to denounce anti-whiteism at universities, at their university, humongous victory institutionally. And then, of course, what I just got clear confirmation of myself was this talk about Trump using the word anti-white. I had no idea until today's going free. So I just saw the tweet that Jason just showed from Trump himself. A retweet, I guess. But apparently Trump said something like anti-whiteism 101 is canceled or something like that. I didn't look close enough to really see the details. But um, if you use the word anti-white, anti-whiteism, that is huge because it legitimizes the term on a mainstream scale. Obviously Trump has a huge stage. That's about the biggest stage you can get these days, pretty much. So that, just to put that word out there, is gigantic. Nothing less than absolute world-changing victory right there. That is the clear, clearest sign of victory we could get it reaches the mainstream at that high of a level. And if it was anti, if you know, the anti-whiteism 101 type of stuff, that makes me think it was about universities. Um, maybe in particular, saying that the, the anti-whiteism in universities is going to come to an end. Maybe that was the specific slant of it. I don't know the intent behind exactly what Trump was saying. It was definitely white positive statement that we should all be happy about and um, you know if it's coming to an end in universities coming to an end anywhere that's a good thing coming to an end in general that's a good thing so we're on the we're starting to get to the home stretch it seems like and we still got a ways to go it seems like but I think we're starting to see that sunrise coming out clearer and clearer with when we see it in the mainstream like that that makes me feel like wow we're, we're almost there so we're gonna keep going keep doing our due diligence and celebrating this huge victory um, so 
that was one of my points that I wanted to make here is about, as we all know, the importance of language. And like Jason says accurately all the time, we think in words. We cannot conceive of anything without using words. Words are what create, what are the building blocks of concepts. So people cannot really understand a concept without the words to go with it um, in general. So, basically, you know, that's the reason a lot of people in the past didn't know that anti-whiteism existed because they didn't know the word anti-white. And even today, lots of people don't know about it uh, or are not really conscious of it because they don't know the word. They don't know what to call it, anti-white. They don't know it's a concept until they get a word for it. Uh, most people, that's how we function. So, this is why words are so important. This is why anti-whites have erased <laughs> anti-white from the dictionary, literally. That's why anti-whites have um, feverishly put great effort into controlling which words are used in general, in the general public. They go to great lengths to erase words that they don't like, and they go to great lengths to promote words that promote their agenda. So we've been living with words mainstream society that are anti-white for a long time inside their narrative um, and they win inside their narrative all every time the only way we can win is by getting outside of their narrative we all know this so Yiz uh, it's a great example what Yiz and her her uh, fellow white well-being compadre I think it was John if I got it right, I'll just say it was John. Uh, if not, my apologies. But that was my impression from the stream so far, is that it was John. Uh, but uh, uh, those, those two uh, demonstrated the power of just getting that word to people. Getting that word to professors at that university. That professor was able to call out the anti-whiteism because Giz and John gave him the word. If that professor didn't get the word from somewhere, he wouldn't have really grasped the concept of anti-whiteism and wouldn't have, wouldn't have been able to call it out. That was That's always what we've been missing as whites uh, to defend ourselves. That's, those are, that's always been the tools that we've been missing. Words that are outside the anti-white narrative that serve us, white well-being, words that are white positive. So, you know, it would have been hard for that professor to really call it out without having the proper tool, just like the proper tool is necessary for any job, any mechanic work on a car, or anything else, you need the proper tools to do a job. You can't screw in a screw with a wrench, and you can't uh, tighten a bolt with a screwdriver. You just gotta have the right tool. So. What Yiz and John did, and a lot of us do, when we, well, this particular example, Yiz and John giving this professor the word anti-white, then, boom, now he had the right tool. He could call it out. Everybody knows it's happening. They just need the word to call it. So then he said, then he was able to recall uh, his own knowledge that he sees every day of this um, anti-whiteism, he can recognize that there are there is oppression uh, against white people all the time. There is this um, lots of things at universities are just against white people. So he was able to recognize this 
from his own experience and say, yes, it, it, it seems wrong that whites, that people are not allowed to say anything positive about whites. That just seems obviously wrong. And then he had the right tool to say, that seems anti-white. To not allow white people or any people to say anything positive about whites, that is against, that's something that's against white people that is anti-white. He had the word, he had the tool, he was able to call it out. Thanks to Yiz and John for giving him that word. Amazing victory at the university level. It cannot be overstated. And of course, all of us are doing the same thing. When we give someone the word anti-white, when we just use it in conversation, we're giving them that word. Even if it's not explicit, giving them the word introducing it to their vocabulary. Um, so think about it. The word is necessary for a concept. Think about trying to explain something to a child or anyone for that matter. And think about think about how the words you use can shape something. You can almost define anything you want any way you want with the wording you use. The anti-whites do this very well, unfortunately. They use words that their true definition, they use words in a way to mean something that is the opposite of their true definition. So for example, diversity. What does diversity really mean? It means variety having some, and when we're talking about race, true diversity would mean having lots of races present, people of many different races present. That's the true definition of diversity with regard to race. Now, we all know this, and we know also that anti-whites use it to mean the opposite exactly. They use it to mean society less white people. So when they see a room full of all blacks, do they say that there's no diversity there? No, they don't. They don't. They don't talk about diversity. They say it's diverse enough. It's okay. There's no problem with diversity, even if there's all blacks, all Latinos, all Asians, any group of all non-whites. It can be all a specific race of non-whites. You know all Chinese, all Japanese, all um, Indonesian, all whatever. And anti-whites, the regime, they're not gonna complain about lack of diversity there because that's not how they use the word. They will only bring up diversity, of course, when there are white people present, when there are especially if there's a lot of white people present, it is only used to reduce, to reduce the number of whites. We all know this. Um, so now think about that. They have managed to use this word, and now when they reduce the number of whites, what are they doing? They are actually decreasing diversity. So by making an environment uh, predominantly non-white, by removing the whites, they are reducing the diversity. So when they try to make an environment all non-white, or great majority non-white, they are reducing the diversity. If the whites are the minority, and they reduce whites even further, that is reducing diversity and they will claim that it increases the diversity because they don't use the true definition of the word. So think about that. They're using a word which most people, a lot of people have a general idea of what the, what the real definition is. Anti-whites are using the definition, using that word in a way that is contrary to the actual definition. And people still use this. 
Why do they do that? They go. Why do they go along with it? Because that is the anti-white narrative. That is how the word is defined in the anti-white narrative that Tom dominates, has dominated mainstream society. So just like Jason says, the mainstream society, uh, really kind of what, what people have in their heads, that defines the word, how the word is used in society, not the definition. How it is applied in society, that is the effective definition of the word. So anti-whites have managed to use lots of words that, you know, is contrary to the real definition. And people go with that. So what does that tell us? That tells us that people um, can be convinced that something is not what it is or it is what it is not just by the word see what I'm saying so that's how um, for example if you start saying that red is blue and blue is red then maybe that's not a good example but you can define something with words different than what it actually is all the way up to meaning the opposite of what it is that's how people can be convinced that something that's good is bad and something that's bad is good because of the words they use that's why they specifically use these nice sounding words diversity that sounds pretty good multiculturalism that sounds pretty good those are all what they all mean is anti-white that's that's a bad sounding word that's what it really is so it's a cover to not to keep people from knowing what is truly going on because if people know what is truly going on they'll recognize it's bad they won't want to have any part of it most people so things are defined a lot more by the terms applied than we even realize most people don't recognize the concept and understand it just by what's with the concept alone without the words they rely on the words and the way those words are used in society to define what it is and whether it's good or bad that's why assigning the proper word to something is critical that's why people don't recognize anti-whiteism because they don't have the word or they have other words that sound good so they don't recognize that it's a big problem. When we give them a word that accurately describes it and how horrible it is, then people can see, okay, it's called anti-whiteism. It's bad, I get it now. And they don't want to participate in it. They will denounce it more and more. So the words are obviously very, very important. That's why anti-whiteism being used, or anti-white being used by Trump is huge. Puts the word out there in a big way. Um, so that's, that's really redefining and bringing our narrative, white positive, into mainstream society. That's what that's doing. Nothing short of absolute um, gigantic victory. Cannot be overstated. The other thing I was going to mention is, um, speaking about the narratives, is that's, that is the difference between, as far as us white positives and having victory. That is what, what allows us to have victory, what determines whether we will have victory or not, as far as I can tell, is whether we're in our narrative, white positive, or the anti-white narrative. Basically, if we're in the anti-white narrative, we will lose every time. If we're in our white positive narrative, we will win every time. That is the deciding factor. There's nothing we can say inside the anti-white narrative that we will win with. Nothing at all. If we're using anti-white terms inside the anti-white narrative, Nothing matters, we will lose. And 
vice versa. Likewise, if we are in our narrative, outside of the anti-white narrative, in our white positive narrative, we will win every time. So what determines winning or losing is not having some clever argument. It's which narrative are you in? That's why Jason talks about this so much and emphasizes it so much. And that's why when he says, when he points out how some very clever people lose arguments all the time, he points it out fervently that it is because they are still inside the anti-white narrative. They will never win inside that narrative. So, now I want to bring up an example of the slogan, of a slogan that is a little bit alluring to whites, but will lose, in my opinion, every time. Because it is inside the anti-white narrative. And it may not, I mean, there may be some disagreement about this, but I'm just, just kind of using this as an example. Um, it's It may be not the best example, but nonetheless, I think it's a good thing to bring up because there may be some confusion about it. The slogan, White Lives Matter, this has been discussed a lot, Jason has brought it up a lot, um, and some people in the white positive sphere use it. By definition, it's a good it's a good slogan. We believe white lives matter, and white lives do matter, and they should matter. But, of course, that's not how it really is interpreted by society at large. It's not taken at face value. So... The reason, the main reason that that slogan, White Lives Matter, fails more often than not, if not all the time, is because it is inside the anti-white narrative. That's why it fails. That's really the only reason. That's what it comes down to. Because it is playing off of a slogan that a certain group of dark non-whites lives matter, matter lives black, that, you know, saying white lives matter is just an obvious, you know, reversal of that. So it's, that kind of takes it down a lot, takes, takes a lot of wind out of its sails, in my opinion, right there. Then, um, it simply can be defeated by anti-whites. All they have to do, like Jason has pointed out, is say, yeah, white lives matter, they matter too much. Why can they say that? Why can they say, white lives matter, they matter too much, therefore, we need them to matter less, and we need non-white lives to matter more. That's all they have to say, and they have just won. Now, why does that work? Because that is the anti-white narrative. That is the fictional anti-white narrative that white lives have mattered too much. That is their narrative. That's what they themselves say. Anti-whites have propagandized people with that very concept that white lives matter. Of course, they say white lives matter too much. That is their anti-white narrative. And that's their justification, their pretext for always trying to make them matter less and less and less. So that is very, that slogan is basically the anti-white narrative. It's so close to their narrative that they can easily defeat it. They say, yeah, white lives matter. All we're saying, what we're saying is white lives matter too much. Yeah, so they, they agree. You just played right into their narrative. We, we all, I'm sure, see how that works. That That is what they perpetuate in their narrative. And so they, they are not countering that in their narrative. They are not truly against that concept because they use that concept as a pretext in their narrative for harming whites. See what we're saying here? See what I'm saying? That fits into their narrative. It's a pretext. White lives matter, in brackets, too much, 
therefore it's okay to harm whites and make their lives matter less, to treat them less. Because they've been too important in the past, it's okay to make them less important now. We all see that, I'm sure, now. That is just words that are in, that is in their narrative. So, um, and also, they, they are not, they are not countering that concept directly. So they don't have to disagree with it. They don't have a genuine desire to disagree with it. They, they don't truly counter that openly, directly. They just use it as a pretext. Whereas no white guilt, they truly do counter that. They truly do, they truly are opposed to that slogan. They're not truly opposed to the slogan, White Lives Matter, because they use it in their narrative as a pretext. There's no way that no white guilt can be used in their narrative. And so they truly just do not like the phrase, no white guilt. They can't use it at all. For They have no way they can use that in their anti-white narrative to inflict harm on whites. There is no way that phrase can be used to inflict harm on whites. In fact, the opposite is what they depend on to inflict harm on whites. They depend on white guilt. They truly depend on white guilt. So the fact that they truly counter, work to the counter of no white guilt, to white guilt people all the time, is one reason no white guilt is effective. And obviously, the main reason is because no white guilt is completely outside of the anti-white narrative. There is nowhere in any pages of all of the anti-white documents that have been written out there, there is nowhere anywhere that the phrase no white guilt is found. It is not in their narrative. It can never fit into their narrative. It can only be used for white positive purposes. They cannot twist it. That is why no white guilt is like a beacon of indefensibility, of defensibility for us. And it cannot be attacked, it cannot be defeated by anti-whites. It is absolutely 100% defensible for us, 100% works for white well-being, white positivity, 100% of the time. So that's the key. That's the key. If we want to understand why phrases work or don't work, it all comes down to what narrative are those phrases in. If it's a phrase that's used by anti-whites in their narrative in any way, shape, or form, it won't work for us. It can and will be defeated. If it is outside of their narrative, if it is in the white positive narrative, our narrative, then it will work for us every single time. So, again, that's the beauty of no white guilt. I was going to put this shirt on for this video, but I'll just show it right here. It's the beauty of this phrase. It cannot be defeated by anti-whites. On that note, the last thing I was going to say is um, as for this as for those, those slogans matter lives black and white lives matter if there's any doubt as to what the slogan Matter Lives Black really is about. We all know it's anti-white. We all know that's, that's the sole purpose of it. But just if you really want to just get this reinforced in yourself, what I was thinking about earlier is we know what that means. Matter Lives Black just translated literally means white lives do not matter. 
That's what the intent of that phrase is to say. It's not to say that that group of non-whites' lives do matter. The sole intent of that phrase, the true meaning of that phrase, is to say white lives do not matter. Now why is that? We can all we can all understand that and see that. But that was always the sole purpose. Now that's coming out more and more, more people are realizing that in the larger um, population. Now, to, to, to put that in perspective, just imagine if the phrase white lives matter were to appear in Africa. Maybe it has, but you know, just not that I know of and probably not on any large scale. But let's say that all of a sudden there was an organization with a lot of money that was pushing the phrase white lives matter all of a sudden all throughout africa 